From the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. Tuesday the 17th, 3 p.m. in London, 10 a.m. in New York, 30 minutes into the trading day in the United States. From London, I'm Guy Johnson, Alex Steele over in New York. Welcome, everybody, to Bloomberg Markets. Alex, I'm looking at the retail sales numbers, and I've, I've been wondering what you've been up to. Me? Nothing. I've actually been buying nothing, which That's totally the explains the retail sales number. I'm not even getting my massages. No more curtain hangings and no more massages. I am the problem. And... I, the massages, I guess. So this is basically the, the thing that's happening, isn't it? That people are, as you say, buying less curtains and going out and consuming more services. And that certainly seems to have shown up. What I thought was interesting was that JP Morgan had an even negative number and they scraped tons of data. Obviously, mm -hmm. they have a huge exposure to the consumer. They thought this number was going to be worse, which makes me wonder, actually, whether or not the data from here on in is going to continue to show this marked slowdown. Yep, and so let's get to the market action because ever since we opened, it's been kind of a slow roll to the downside, and that's exactly what we're seeing S&P now up by eight tenths of one percent, right around the lows uh, of the session. Despite the fact that industrial production data came in relatively stronger than estimated, and just to highlight what Guy was talking about, and this also feeds into that Home Depot story: consumer discretionary down by over two percent, the worst performing sector uh, within the S&P. All of that leaving into a safe haven bid, kind of, into the 10-year yields uh, down, um, uh, down by about one basis point. They were down by about three basis points earlier, so that's a little bit confusing. Uh, and crude continues its slide now. Um, again, can't seem to get any lift. I guess the question becomes, do we see the buy the dip, which is what we saw yesterday, that slow rally into the close? Yeah, that is certainly the muscle memory, isn't it? That's what markets have recently, well, I say recently, for quite a long time now, uh, come to expect will happen. We are in the middle of August. Volume is relatively light, certainly over here in Europe. You could get a little bit more volatility. Maybe that just prolongs uh, the response. The buy the dip doesn't come quite as quickly. The story, though, certainly remains what is happening uh, in Afghanistan. The political leaders there seeking talks with the Taliban. Those are expected to take place in Doha uh, about the formation of a new government. Kabul airport flights are resuming this, according to the White House though the situation on the ground remains incredibly volatile. President Biden, meanwhile, is standing by his decision to withdraw the U.S. troops. I stand squarely behind my decision. After 20 years, I've learned the hard way that there was never a good time to withdraw U.S. forces. Let's talk about the fallout from that speech and how it's gone in the various constituencies that matter. Let's go to D.C. Our Washington correspondent, Amory Hordern, joining us now from the White House. Amory. Good morning, Guy. Well, you heard it there from the president really doubling down on his decision to the, for this withdrawal. And he outlined the two reasons why. And we've heard them before. One was, of course, an inherited deal that the Trump administration had with the Taliban. And the second was the fact that he pointed to the unwillingness of the Afghan forces to fight after the U.S. has put a trillion dollars into the country in two decades. The question the president did not answer, and one that I imagine the press is going to be asking his national security advisor Jake Sullivan and press secretary Jen Psaki when they have a briefing later this afternoon, is why the hasty, why the chaotic fallout of the withdrawal that we saw unfold over the weekend. What I can update you on is what White House officials are saying, that flights are resuming now from Kabul airport, which uh, they were halted for a while, and also that at the moment there's 3,500 troops on the ground with more on the way. All right, Emery, thank you very much. Those images still staggering. Emery Hordern from Bloomberg. All right, the U.S. government is preparing to offer coronavirus booster shots as soon as next month. Biden administration officials are expected to recommend the shots be taken eight months after people receive their second vaccine dose. Here with Morris Bloomberg's a senior editor for healthcare, Drew Armstrong. That eight months mark has already passed for some, particularly those uh, really immunocompromised or the elderly. Uh, what can we expect? When do we expect? Well, I think what we'll see is sort of a abbreviated version of what the initial vaccine rollout looked like um, with, you know, obviously a lot more supply and capacity to administer doses because that's pretty well established in the United States at this point, you know, and, and probably, frankly, a little bit lower demand. I mean, I think 
we have seen, you know, lots and lots of people who rushed out to get first doses, but there are some people who are going to already feel they're protected. You won't necessarily get the exact same level of uptake with these people getting booster doses as you had the first go round. But the idea is basically to say, hey, we think one more boost helps provide a little bit more protection from the immune system as we know protection begins to fade right as we may be heading for a fall wave of new cases. You do wonder whether this further entrenches the already significant political divide on vaccines in the United States. Bloomberg's Drew Armstrong, thank you very much indeed. I want to take a step back to the Afghanistan story. We're getting news uh, that there's been a phone call between European leaders, Angela Merkel speaking with uh, Emmanuel Macron, Boris Johnson uh, on the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, that conversation happening recently. There is talk of a G7 conference or meeting uh, to discuss what is going on on the ground uh, and how best to deal with it now. Certainly a lot of finger pointing here in Europe towards Washington. Uh, as, as Alex says, we saw those chaotic scenes unfold over the weekend. Let's get back to the data and the, uh, the lack of spending by Alex Steele over the, uh, the last <laughs> period uh, because it now seems to be showing up really quite significantly in the data. US retail sales falling in July by much more than forecast. Consumers shifting their spending away from stuff towards services. Here with the details to break the numbers down, our international economics and policy correspondent, Mike McKee. Well, Guy, the interesting thing is we don't know whether it's a shift to services or not, yet we won't get that data until the end of the month. What we do know is that the retail sales numbers came in very disappointing, down 1.1%, and that was much more than the three-tenths decline that was forecast. Now, the question is why I put this up here. Is it the stimmy checks? Maybe I should have written, is it Alex? But instead, I'm going to go with the stimmies and, not, and, and let her off the hook today. You can see what happened here. This is the first round of stimulus checks. And then these are the ones we got first of the year and then the Biden ones that came on later. And you can see how spending just went way up. And people bought stuff. And now they're not buying as much. Now, one of the things that's happened, of course, is that auto sales have fallen off a lot. And that was one of the big movers this time, down 4.3% in terms of auto sales. That's nominal. That's dollar figures. And the reason there probably is because there aren't enough cars to buy because of the yeah. semiconductor shortage. So it's not just auto sales, but clothing sales people probably bought. And it's still a little early for uh, back to school. Grocery stores, if it were the pandemic, if it were the Delta variant, people would be staying home and probably buying more food, but instead food sales at grocery stores went down. Food and drink, if you were worried about the variant, you wouldn't be going out, but that was one of the categories, uh, maybe this is where Alex comes in and helps <laughs> us out here, uh, that did rise during the month. The biggest difference though, and this is what a lot of people are pointing to, is a drop in internet buying. And there could be a couple of reasons for this, but non-store retailers fall off significantly during the month. And as you can see here, that's been happening for a couple of months. So it isn't just the stimulus, it's kind of that people have got what they need at this point. There was also a thought that because Amazon moved Prime Day to July, that distorted the spe to June rather, that distorted the spending people bought in June. But it's not just that, because as you can see, we see a decline starting after April and May when the stimulus checks came into people's pockets. We'll have to wait till the end of the month to see about services. So Alex, it's not just the massages because those don't show up in the retail sales numbers. Okay, no massages though because of Delta variant, but I am going out to eat but eating outdoors just in case I'm like a microcosm of the rest of the, the country. Well, that's Anyways. why it's still going up and your country thanks you. You're, you're welcome. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Bloomberg's uh, Michael McKee. I am shopping for clothes on sale though. I'm just saying, if you get a good enough sales, I'm there. All right, well, coming up, we're gonna take a look at the consumer shift uh, off of the retail sales data. Uh, Ju Julie Beal, uh, Kane Anderson, uh, R Rudnick Portfolio Manager is joining us next. This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on the Bloomberg First World News. I'm Rishka Gupta. In Afghanistan, the Taliban uh, are urging women to join the new government. A member of the Taliban's Cultural Commission says the group does not want women to be victims. When the Taliban were previously in power, women were largely confined to their homes. The U.S. government is preparing to offer coronavirus booster shots as soon as next month. Biden administration officials are expected to recommend the shots be taken eight months after people receive their second vaccine dose. The U.S. is facing a renewed wave of infections fueled by the Delta variant. 
In New Zealand, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern says the country will go into a level four lockdown. That's the most restrictive type. That's after authorities detected their first local case of coronavirus in 170 days. New Zealand has been in a level four lockdown only once before. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. All right, thanks so much, Ritika. So retail sales, we've been talking about it falling in July more than estimated. Uh, are consumers uh, becoming more price conscious as inflation picks up? That's one question that's percolating. Uh, the reaction in the market, though, is stiff. You have the S&P uh, right around the lows of the session. Julie Beal, Kane Anderson, Redneck Portfolio Manager, joins us now. Julie, yesterday was a case of buy the dip. We're dropping like a stone here. Are you buying the dip? I think there are definitely some opportunities for long-term investors to buy into companies that may have been a little beaten up. Really high quality businesses have been on sale for a couple of weeks now. I would think of a company like Fair Isaac, FICO, Duck Creek Technologies. Um, there are some great technology names that had gotten very expensive and pulled back. And I think those are great opportunities. But again, we're focused on a time horizon that's five years. So we look for opportunities, but generally speaking, we don't make day to day trading decisions. Julie, if I can just shorten the time frame up a little bit. Um, okay. If we take a look at the 13 Fs from last night, not much, but a little bit. Uh, if we take a look at the 13 Fs from last night, the hedge fund community basically decided a little while ago that the Delta variant was going to cause trouble, and as a result of which they switched away from reopening to stay-at-home trades. They bought Peloton, etc. You think that probably is the way to go as well? You've got more of a defensive bias. My question to you is, how long does that situation last for? Does it take us into the fall? And if so, like, does it take us through to Christmas and the beginning of next year as well? Yes, I think actually this fall and winter is going to feel worse than last year. And I think that's because last year, all we were fighting about was masks. And now we're fighting about masks, vaccines, booster shots, schools reopening, stimulus checks. It's much more complicated and convoluted situation. And I think that's going to cause a pause in consumer sentiment and spending. And I think that has actually important implications for Biden's approval rating and policy decisions around that. So I think it's actually going to be a harder fall and winter than most people are expecting. So does that mean that we're going to have to rethink this sort of stay at home recovery trade rather than a reopening or shutting down altogether, which kind of pairs to the whole like we're fighting over everything here in the US. If we have a stay at home recovery, what does that do to a portfolio? I think focusing on the longer term durable names that can handle both a reopening and do well if we are all staying at home, those are the kinds of names that we're focusing on because it's really hard to know, right? It's, it's just so hard to predict, so let's prepare. And so for us, it's not so much stay at home versus reopen, it's more what businesses can do well even if the economy is struggling. And those are just the quality businesses that you look for. Do you want to give me some names? Yeah, I, I really like the company Avalara. So Avalara, and it could kind of play into the, the stay at home, but Avalara helps companies in e-commerce manage their tax statements in terms of the sales tax that they pay. So if you're in New York and you go to a deli, if you eat the bagel on site versus if you take the bagel away, that's a different tax rate. And that's just really hard to manage, right? I mean, it's kind of silly. So many of these businesses face these kind of Byzantine tax laws and Avalara helps you categorize that and then have it perfectly filed. It allows you to kind of outsource your compliance for tax reporting. So that's a business that we think has a lot of opportunities still in front of it, especially if they start doing W-9s, 1099s, et cetera. That's a company that we really like and we think could benefit from staying home, but has long-term legs beyond that. Um, what else in the consumer space as we're kind of straddling this? Are we buying stuff? Are we buying services? How do we continue to buy? Um, do we buy drinks out or drinks in? What are some other businesses that can straddle both? Uh, a company that I really like uh, that I think has long term legs that stayed open uh, you know, during the during the, the shutdown is Ollie's Bargain Outlets. And what's great about Ollie's is you have both staples that you can buy. It's closeout merchandise, but there's also just the random little things that Americans just love to buy. Right. There's just a group of us that love to buy things at a discount. And so you walk into an Ollie's and you see a space heater for 30 bucks. You don't need a space heater, but you can't miss that deal, right? <laughs> so I, I think if you go into an Ollie's, you see that people there are shopping both for entertainment and for need. And I think that's very much a great theme within the US consumer is, you know, we do all like to buy things. Uh, and that's one that just yeah. really has been able to do well over the long term.
I've heard about that kind of bargain hunting on this show before. I can't think who was talking. Oh, yeah, Alex. I don't know. It's so weird. It's like my mom or something. <laughs> Um, Julie, let's talk about what happens over the next few months as well. How much turbulence are you expecting in the markets as a result of what the Fed is going to do? We're going to hear from Jay Powell a little bit later on. The expectation is that we're going to see a taper uh, as we go through the next few months or at least start to get the details of it. How much turbulence is that going to cause? I think it's going to have an impact on valuations. So for our higher valuation companies, you know, the, the interest rate expectations, it's going to play out. We've seen that the you know, higher valuation companies have risen and part of that is, I think, that no one really expected interest rates to decline in the way that they have. I think if there's more indication and more solidifying around the idea that interest rates are going up and that tapering is going to happen, that could impact the highest valuation companies. But I think in the near term, interest rates probably are staying around here. And the volatility is going to be more around, around the tapering and what we're tapering, mortgage or treasury. Um, Julie, last question. Um, what do you do with the potential infrastructure program? Like, are you already pricing that into to stuff? Are you already trying to play it or what? We've owned Bentley Securities, uh, Bentley, sorry, uh, Bentley Technologies for a long time, and that's a company that does infrastructure software. So it helps collaboration on a large infrastructure project. And that's the only way really that we're kind of aggressively playing infrastructure because part of it is that even though it's wonderful that that's happened and it's going to create jobs and it, it really is an important opportunity for us, these projects take a really long time. So I don't think we're really ready to get aggressively playing in that. And the rest of the providers of infrastructure typically are commodity companies with low returns on capital. Julie, thanks for getting up to talk to us. Really appreciate it. Julie Beal of Kane Anderson Rudnick joining us from Santa Monica. It's a little earlier there. Uh, I want to take you to the Pentagon now. We have a briefing underway. Press Secretary Kirby briefing the press now on what is happening uh, in Afghanistan on the ground. More than 4,000 troops, we understand, will be on the ground in Kabul by the end of the day. Um, in terms of what happens next, uh, we are seeing the airport open, secure to both civilian and military flights. I think they're, they're departing around one an hour at the moment. So around 5,000 to 9,000 passengers can leave per day Kabul airport. But the expectation is still that we are going to see the U.S. withdrawing troops by August the 31st. So this is very much a short-term operation that is currently being managed by the Pentagon. Still ahead, another day of pain for Chinese stocks listed in the United States. More selling pressure. One long-time holder of Chinese tech giants, well, she's now changing her mind. Yep, that's the person we're talking about. We're going to talk art next. This is Bloomberg. We do own in some of our more specialized funds, uh, some Chinese stocks have tried to stay away from uh, uh, those that uh, are uh, privy to a lot of private information and are online, um, although you can't stay away from all of them. Uh, but we have minimized our positions significantly. And in our flagship fund, uh, I, I don't, we don't ha own any more Chinese stocks. Kathy Wood speaking to Bloomberg a few days back. She's not the only fund manager that is souring on China. The latest disclosures by hedge funds definitely show a wave of famous managers selling ADRs in big names. For more on what's on the move uh, from these uh, hedge funds and other popular trades that we're seeing uh, highlighted by the 13Fs, we're joined as ever by Bloomberg's Shanali Basak. Walk me through the China trade first. Yeah, it's very interesting from Kathy Wood, who has said, yes, there's been a lot of innovation coming out of China, particularly in payments and financial services with WeChat and Alipay. But the, the tone, the stance that China's taking can create a longer term headwind when it comes to valuations and perhaps move a lot of business to the U.S. as supply chains in particular take shape and become vertically integrated. She speaks to Tesla, for example, which we know is the top, one of the top holdings in her flagship fund here. Uh, an interesting thing in other Kathy Wood news, you see that Michael Burry short all comes home at the end of the day. You have him shorting Tesla, you have him having these puts against Kathy Wood, her really negating his view here. But there's kind of no uh, dispute here that as far as valuations go with China, 
uh, that that's one part of the story that could last a while. So she is sort of on her own in some respects. And they've had a lot of good boy, uh, big voices talking about how, like Michael Burry, uh, shorting ARK investment. You also wind up having um, other individuals saying China is now completely uninvestable. Yeah, that's that's true. That's Paul Marshall, right? The big hedge fund manager that's saying that now. And you saw so many big hedge funds get out in July. Alibaba was one of the biggest uh, stocks sold by the hedge fund industry. I've got to say, while you see this a longer term trajectory of selling, you see some divergence as well. I want to point to JD.com, for example, which during the second quarter had a lot of big names come into it, like Viking, like D1, so uh, like Melvin Capital. So there seems to be a question about whether they stayed after the second quarter, number one. Are there values to be found in China, even with these broader headwinds that exist? But uh, up till now, that is one area where you know China in general, longer term valuations for the companies that have been so high flying for so long, you're seeing a true reversal and something that could last for, if not months, years. Shanali, one of the other things that the hedge funds have been doing is front running the Delta trade. I, they saw it coming. They knew it was going to have an impact, and it certainly has. We've seen that in the data. They shifted to the stay at home trade. Is that just tactical or is that going to be sustained? It's interesting you ask that because one of the trades a lot of people are talking about is Co2 and Moderna, for example. Uh, Seth Klarman also getting into the healthcare industry. Healthcare was one of the biggest areas of buying and not just when it comes to the pharma companies and the biotech companies. You also see Centene was a popular trade in the quarter. So, yes, you see a lot of people betting, Peloton, Zoom on these traditional stay-at-home companies, and it draws a question about whether this was a short-term thing or whether they're seeing more pain in the future. You know that some of these funds last year gained a lot during the pandemic, both by gaining from kind of the Fed stepping into the market, but also on these stay-at-home trades. So, you know, on the other side, Guy, you have private equity stepping way into that reopening trade. So at the end of the day, which money is right? All right, which one is right? Exactly. That's how you make a market. Um, Bloomberg, Shalai Basic joining us there. I mean, I suffice it to say, though, this is always backward looking, so you never really know what happened uh, in the last few weeks. But we do know what's happening right now, and right now is some weakness uh, in consumer spending. Let's dig a little deeper into why. Just look at Home Depot with comp sales missing estimates. We're going to talk, break that down with Steph uh, Winsink. Uh, Jeffrey's Consumer Equity Research Managing Director is going to weigh in on that disappointing number, what it means for retail U.S. consumers, uh, as well as how to deal with stocks like Home Depot. This is Bloomberg. Live from New York, I'm Alex Yeo, Guy Johnson over in London. This is Bloomberg Markets. Uh, so you had retailers uh, setting up, wrapping the second quarter earnings season over the last couple of days. Home Depot, Walmart resulting uh, both left with some investors wanting a little bit more there. Bloomberg's uh, Dave Wilson is here with some of the details. Dave, welcome to the numbers. Well, I mean, really, Home Depot is more the story than Walmart, arguably, in the wake of their second quarter results, fiscal second quarter, to be more precise. The periods ended in July. You know, it's all about growth at stores open more than a year, not measuring up to what analysts were looking for. And a big reason for that is they just didn't have as many people walking through the doors. They made fewer sales, but the sales they did make were bigger because there was a shift towards serving contractors as opposed to uh, mom and pop, shall we say, uh, do-it-yourselfers. So, you know, a change in the business. And then beyond that, you're talking about when you focus in on those uh, comparable sales, the slowest growth in about two years. And this is a company that for the past four quarters had 20% plus increases in same store sales. People were staying home. They wanted to fix up their houses. Uh, they wanted to do all kinds of things. But that, uh, you know, it seems to have faded a bit. And what else is fading when you look at Walmart is their online business, uh, which really ramped up in the second quarter of their uh, fiscal year last year. I mean, a lot of that clearly tied into the pandemic. People wanted to order online, didn't want to go to the stores. 
Now that's changing. You're talking about 6% growth in their latest quarter. You go back a year ago and it almost doubled. So and things have been slowing down in the interim. So, I mean, that's an issue at Walmart. But you look across the business and things are holding up okay. And what we're really looking at is sort of the leading edge of retail earnings for this week. Uh, biggest rival of, Lowe's, of uh, Home Depot, Lowe's, is out tomorrow. So is Walmart's biggest rival, Target, and a bunch of other companies where they came from, including, I should note on Thursday, beyond uh, Macy's and Estee Lauder that we see here, uh, Ross Stores, Kohl's, and Tapestry, the owner of Coach. Dave, great stuff. Let's carry on the conversation about what is happening with shopping, retail. We see data today. We've got the corporates reporting. It's a great day to talk about what is happening here. Steph Whitting, Jeffrey's Consumer Equity Research Managing Director, joining us now uh, to give us her take. Let's start off big picture, kind of from, from the, the view from 30,000 feet. The data seems to suggest the consumer is slowing down. Is that the right way of reading this? Yeah, I think we have to at least recognize the data points. We had confidence last week that was a bit softer. Overall retail sales today coming in a little bit softer. But it's interesting when you look at different companies, I mean, Walmart results today to us were actually very confirming of that bottom end, that more value-oriented consumer. Comps beat, margins look solid, and ultimately EPS beating. And I think for us, as we look at you know the lens of mass and department stores, which is our focus, we are still seeing some improvement. Um, and I think it's just depending on when you're looking at the global level versus down into some of the category or, or channel level, you're seeing some very different dynamics at play. And, and maybe that's showing up a little bit in these confidence numbers that the consumer is still just a little bit disoriented, mm -hmm. trying to figure out where to go when, uh, but still hopeful that maybe we'll see some improvement as the, the fall progresses. Steph, just for a Home Depot for a moment, I mean, that's got down 5%. No doubt tough comps are going to come into play for this company, but they still had sales growth. Do you feel that that sort of uh, hit on the equity side is unjustified, or can these kind of stay-at-home retail guys still do very well, even as comps toughen? Yeah, I think just broadly, broadly thinking about the home category, we are still seeing consumer spending on home. And so there is this element of we haven't fully returned to a new normal in terms of office versus home. And I think we're going to be in this space for a while. You're already seeing companies that had initially planned to return to office after Labor Day are pushing that out into early October. I know our firm is doing the same, and we're hearing that broadly from a number of retail contacts, that they're just seeing this elongation of the return cycle. And as we think about back to school, I mean, that is a big home or home derivative category, if we think about dorm in particular. And so far, we're seeing some pretty strong signs of evidence that that return to college or return to university is performing. So I think it just depends on within the home category, maybe home improvement and investment into big, big ticket areas like appliances and upgrades is maybe giving way a little bit to those more discretionary areas of decor and dorm and some of the other areas that would be more tied to the seasonal effect of the fall. Steph, is inflation going to eat into margins? There's some evidence of that within these numbers. Yeah, I think for the first time we heard companies really taking a more diplomatic stance on inflation, that we are going to see some price in increases as the uh, back half progresses. And I would say we, even if we just reverse the calendar and listen to what the vendors or the manufacturers that sell into these retailers have said over the course of the last three weeks, they're all indicating that they have put retailers on notice. They have sent in or submitted their notification of price increases to come. And usually there's about a 90-day a window that they need to advise. And so we know that these price increases are going to be coming in that October, November timeframe. So will it eat into margins? I think as long as the consumer remains healthy in terms of wage growth, as long as we see the reemployment cycle unfold here as the federal um, unemployment benefits start to wear down, I think there's going to be enough spending power to support the price increases. But if those increases continue to go up, just based on some of the supply issues we're seeing, then we might start to see some friction as we get into the holiday season. When do consumers stop spending because prices are too high? Yeah, this is a question that's kind of an age-old question in retail, like what, how much is too much? Yeah, you know, I think the consumer, when we look at wage growth, we look at minimum wage and, and what that has, uh, look, has changed over the course of the last several years, we're up you know, double digits on double digits. I think we see the upper middle and upper income uh, wage growth has continued and persisted and actually employment at that and those classes has remained pretty resolute. So most people think about, you know, as we get to that mid to upper single digit price inflation, that's where you start to see some pullback across the entire wage continuum. 
Um, but if we're thinking about just the upper end, probably less sensitivity to price, where the, the big sensitivity is, is in that middle and that lower end. All right, Steph, thanks a lot. We really appreciate the take today. Steph Winsick of Jeffries, thank you. All right, coming up, Mike Henry, BHP Abilitin CEO, will be joining us next. It basically exits the oil and gas business. Huge strategic shift today after the first half results. We'll break it down with the CEO. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Market. I'm Rizka Gupta, and you're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Max Borkas, the former U.S. ambassador to China. That's at 12.30 p.m. in New York, 5.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. From New York, I'm Alex Steele, Guy Johnson's over in London. This is Bloomberg Market. So one stock to watch today, BHP Billiton, one of the biggest miners in the world, quits oil, selling its oil and gas business to Woodside Petroleum, an Australian company. It also fully commits billions to developing a new potash mine in Canada and is unifying its dual listing structure. Joining me now is BHP Group CEO Mike Henry, as well as anchor Caroline Hyde. Welcome so much, both of you. Caroline, go ahead, kick it off for us. Alex, thank you so much for having us. And Mike, just a, a few little bits of news today. I love the lead quote in the Bloomberg story saying it's a less boring bulletin. Talk to us about these mega trends, this focus on decarbonization, food security. Why now? Well, look, sometimes boring is good, but I really hope that the, you know, the big moves that BHP is making today to position itself for the future shine through today's announcement off the back of such a strong set of uh, results with record production at a few of our operations, uh, great cash flow generation at 19.4 billion US dollars, a record uh, final dividend for the year to two uh, US dollars per share, bringing total returns to shareholders this year to, to 15 billion uh, US dollars. But off the back of that really strong underlying business, we've made some big um, uh, announcements today. Uh, one of those announcements, of course, is the investment in a potash project in, in, uh, up in Canada, 5.7 billion US dollars. That gives us a new growth front for the company and exposure to, to what we term a future-facing commodity, so a commodity that's leveraged to the mega trends unfolding around us. And we've merged our, or we've announced an intent to merge our business with uh, uh, Woodside, um, and that's going to create a larger, more competitive, top ten global independent ENP company that will also be better able to navigate the energy transition. Hey, Mike, let's unpack all that. Um, I'm going to go to oil and gas for a second. And I guess I'm curious as to what changed, because as of late 2019, it felt like the idea was like, you guys can do the oil and gas business better than other people, so you're just going to stick with it. What changed over that time that made you think that uh, selling it or, or spinning it off to Woodside was better? Sure. So we've been really clear over time that we constantly review our underlying portfolio. And we're always looking for opportunities to create greater value for shareholders, what the best ownership of our underlying assets is. And, and in this case, um, you know, our underlying investment thesis around oil and gas hasn't changed. We think that the, the, invest, the investments in, in certain oil and gas assets are going to remain attractive for at least the next decade and, and likely beyond. But there is an opportunity here for us to achieve a few things. One is create more value for shareholders through the merging of these two companies into a stronger, more resilient, more competitive company and unlock synergies in, in doing so, which are quite material. Uh, secondly, we give shareholders choice. So recognizing that some shareholders see uh, opportunity in oil and gas, others uh, less so, this gives them the, the choice as to how they want to allocate mm -hmm. their uh, portfolio. But in addition, in addition to that, it frees up capital uh, within the, the remaining BHP, it frees up more capital to devote to shareholder returns and or to investing in these future-facing commodity opportunities that are, going to, um, that are going to create value for shareholders for decades to come. And the reality, it's probably going to be a bit of both. So on that then, what other businesses are on the table? And I'm just going to put out there, say, Met Coal, for example, uh, particularly if you go towards a fossil-free business environment. So we've been clear on how we see uh, Metco, and we do believe that, there, that uh, certain qualities or certain um, uh, segments of metallurgical coal, being the high-quality hard coking coal, does have positive leverage to the decarbonization thematic, because in order for the global economy to decarbonize, a couple of things have to happen. One is there's going to need to be a lot more infrastructure that's steel-intensive, 
to, to support that transition. And steel, of course, requires metallurgical coal for the time being. The second thing is that as steel makers seek to decarbonize over a longer term horizon, they'll be able to do that with new technologies that don't requ require coal. But for the coming couple of decades, they're going to uh, seek to reduce their emissions intensity by increasing the, 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 the productivity of the steel making process. That requires higher quality hard coking coal and BHP is sitting on the world's best resource of that type of coal. Let's talk about the money you're spending, the 5.7 billion on that Jensen potash mine and a lot of deliberation, deliberations here. The rate of return, 12 to 14 percent, that's slightly below where the usual focus is for BHP. What is the longer term return on this investment that you finally came to with potash? Well, so, so we've said 12 to 14 percent at, at consensus prices, and we think that's pretty healthy, um, particularly taking into account that this is a greenfield uh, uh, investment. Now, what comes off the back of that, of course, is a, a series of higher returning brownfields expansion opportunities. But the only decision that we're taking today is this initial stage, stage one. But it does open up a new high return growth front for the company. Uh, and one that's going to generate really healthy margins, 70% margins over time, and it's going to generate strong cash flow for decades to come. In fact, we think that that, that mine has the potential to operate for 100 years or, or more. Let's talk about the healthy margins right here, right now, Mike, because iron ore, just price is continuing to soar. But I'm interested in, as we see those sort of record prices, how sustainable they are. What is the demand picture that you're seeing at the moment, particularly coming out of China? So look, the demand picture remains really strong off the back of a healthy underlying Chinese economy, but it's not just China. We're seeing economic recovery underway in other markets around the world as, as well. So strong, uh, we, the strong economic outlook. There has been some supply side constraints in, in iron ore, which has helped to, to support pricing. We do expect that we're gonna see more supply coming online. So a bit of recovery out of Brazil, maybe a little bit more supply out of Australia. Um, so we're certainly not calling for you know, current levels of, of pricing to continue for, forever. But for the time being, we see you know, a healthy um, uh, overall market dynamic for iron ore. Where do you see a super cycle, Mike? In what commodities? So look, our long run thesis is that we're gonna see strong demand for the commodities that BHP uh, holds. So copper, nickel, uh, certainly potash, even iron ore and high quality hard coking coal uh, are going to be important for, because of the role that they play in steel, which is positively leveraged to the decarbonization thematic and electrification and, and, and so on. Uh, now, if we bring that into the near term, of course, we are seeing strong uh, economic growth globally, very supportive uh, monetary or very supportive uh, government policy that we all think bode well to the near term dynamic for, for uh, commodities. Uh, Mike, just one uh, other thing in the, the release we haven't gotten to yet. I just want to get your understanding of it. And that comes with the uh, unifying the dual listing that you had Australia uh, and the UK. I know you're in the UK and you're going to tell me that the UK is important. But the decision wound up hurting a lot of shareholders who now have to sell the stock. They can't own it because it can't be in that blue chip index. Um, what are you thinking about what your shareholder base is going to be now? Look, so I, you know, I'm glad you got it out there. We continue to see uh, shareholders in PLC as being very important. And, and I want to see as many of those continue to hold uh, BHP as, as, as uh, and most of them continue to hold BHP going forward. And they'll be able to do that either through directly holding the primary listing in Australia or the secondary listing here in, in London. Now, could there be some shareholders who, who uh, are forced sellers? Yes, uh, uh, clearly, but we think that shareholders overall are going to see this as being a really positive move for shareholders overall, um, and they'll understand why the company is doing this, and that's to set the company up for the future. It's going to make us more efficient uh, and more agile, and of course, that agility matters in, in, in today's world. The other point I would note is that uh, the ASX listing has historically traded a pretty significant premium to the London uh, uh, listing. Uh, and so I'm sure that will, will be in shareholders' minds as well, given that they're going to get a one-for-one -one, uh, exchange of a limited share for every PLC share that they currently hold. Some of the focus on the unifying of the listing, you say, is to make yourself more nimble. Let's talk about the focus on M&A, therefore, acquisitions. Where do you think you would go? Well, look, so... Um, let me start with us wanting to grow our exposure to future facing commodities. And you know, broadly, those are copper, nickel, uh, potash. Um, we have four levers available to us to do so. One is on innovation, which allows us to extract more of the resource that we already have. 
Uh, two is exploration. Uh, three, early stage entry. So this is get, you know, getting an early toehold in those deposits that have already been found but have yet to be developed. And then finally is, is, is M&A. Now on the M&A front, we did announce a, um, an offer in Canada uh, in, in recent weeks for a company called Neurant. That's for a yet to be developed uh, deposit supported by the board. Um, but I wanna be really clear here. We are very disciplined when it comes to, uh, uh, to M&A. Uh, we're always um, you know, keeping in mind where commodity prices are at, what the implications of the, that, those commodity prices are for uh, asset values. Um, but if the right opportunity comes, comes along uh, at the right price and it competes well under our capital allocation framework versus other opportunities to deploy cash or return to shareholders, then we want to be, able, we want to be set up to be able to uh, pursue that in as agile a fashion as possible and in the most competitive way possible. Even, of course, focusing on that key stakeholder that is the shareholder, I know you also have a keen focus on the other key stakeholder that is your employee base. I'm interested how you find the labor market right now. We talk about it, Alex talks about it, Guy talks about it, I talk about it day in, day out. Some of the frictions that we see, some of the concerns about the Delta variant as well. Of course, I know you've been focusing on, on strike action in Chile. How are you looking at the labor market at the moment and how are you looking to keep your employees happy? A couple of things to say on this. So one is in Chile, we reached uh, uh, an agreement on, on that uh, negotiation in, in the past uh, few days. So uh, we, we are obviously very pleased with that. In terms of the broader uh, labor market, um, our employees have stepped up uh, quite incredibly over the past 18 months to help the company navigate COVID. And they're really at the heart of what's unlocked these great results that we've been able to talk to uh, today. Uh, in certain pockets, um, you know, in, in the face of, of COVID, and I'll talk here about Australia, which, is, which comprises a big part of our, our business, uh, given um, lockdowns and, and, and movement constraints in different parts of the country, we are finding that's giving rise to localized constraints on labor and a bit of labor inflation. But overall, uh, you know, th um, things are, 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 are within the range of, of expected outcomes for the year. And of course, for a company like BHP, we pride ourselves on being able to lean into challenges like this, uh, become more productive and ensure that we're, you know, we're offsetting some of the inflation that we're seeing come through either on the labor front or even more so on some of the other inputs to the business, which of course, start with commodities. So the fact that commodity prices are higher drives a bit of inflation on inputs like steel mm -hmm. or, uh, or, or the other things that, that we buy to, to run our operations. But the net story there is really positive because that inflation is being, yeah. is, is being driven in part by higher commodity prices. Hey Mike, real quick, you said at the forefront of sort of the old world of energy and commodities and the new world of energy and commodities. Do you think the push to decarbonization will eventually be inflationary as we see the prices of say nickel, lithium, copper, all the stuff we're gonna use to make the stuff to green the world. Is that gonna be longer term inflationary? Of course that's going to lead to, to some economic growth and a bit of inflation. Uh, but one of the really important points I'd like to get out there is that um, for the world to be able to tackle the challenge of climate change, which it must, it really needs to ensure that these commodities or the incremental commodity demand is being brought to market in the most efficient, cost-effective, and most sustainable way uh, possible. And therefore, it's going to be important that the market look to companies like BHP, who have a long uh, track record of being at the forefront of, of sustainable mining, to be the ones that, that, that do bring that, uh, that further production to, uh, to market to meet that demand. All right, Mike, thanks very much. We truly appreciate your time today. Thank you for giving us so much of it. BHP Group CEO Mike Henry and Bloomberg Caroline Hyde, thank you very much as well. And we're going to bring you more on BHP and the impact on the market uh, in the next hour, particularly how it affects those FTSE investors. This is Bloomberg. It's time for the Bloomberg Business Flash to look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. I'm Rishka Gupta. Walmart posted second quarter results that beat expectations. The world's largest retailer also raised its sales forecast for the year. Results show demand isn't disappearing following last year's sales boom. Meanwhile, Walmart's e-commerce sales in the U.S. rose just 6%. Demand for internet shopping was expected to slow as customers returned to stores. There's a sign that the do-it-yourself boom has slowed down. Home Depot reported second quarter sales that were weaker than expected. Same-store sales rose 4.5% missing estimates. Home Depot declined to release a forecast for fiscal 2021, noting the uncertainty caused by the coronavirus. 
And that is your latest Business Flash. Alex Sky. Rika, thank you very much indeed. We don't have pictures, but the Taliban is now holding its first press conference uh, after Kabul has fallen. Uh, the Taliban saying, quote, we have liberated the nation from the occupation. The interesting thing here is that while this may be the same Taliban or even a enhanced Taliban, they are much more media savvy. And it's also going to be interesting to find out exactly what the leadership looks like. And we still don't know what that ultimately is going to look like. I think these are the live pictures we're now starting to get. Anyway, we'll continue to monitor. The European close is going up next. Uh, we'll talk about what is happening with the equity market as well. That's next. This is Bloomberg.